Hello, and welcome to the Hard Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Lapo. I'm a mechanical engineer and founder of multiple successful hardware companies. Today, my guest is Julia Parker, founder of Intuitive Horseware, a developer of technology to detect abnormal movement patterns in horses that are due to pain. Julia has three decades of experience as a farrier. A farrier, by the way, takes care of horses' hooves. She also has extensive experience with rescuing and rehabbing horses, and she's also an avid horse rider. Please enjoy. The French poet Anatole France once said, until one has loved an animal, a part of one's soul remains unawakened. How much are we, the general public, unaware of the pain animals endure, and specifically animals like horses used for work or sports? Um, pretty, the percentage is pretty high that people are unaware of what's going on with our animals. Um, unfortunately, just because with, um, when, when people communicate, we use a lot of words. Um, even though they've, they've seen that, uh, over 70% of language is actually communicated non-verbally, um, which, you know, with, with most animals, uh, you know, dogs are an exception when they bark or whine or something like that, that'll give us a better indication of what's, what their emotions are feeling. Um, horses are, uh, far more stoic. Um, so they don't necessarily engage all that much. And in all honesty, some of the training practices are, you know, they want horses to just stand there and be quiet. Um, so we almost kind of train the horses to not communicate with us, um, which is unfortunate because um, the the horses, when they're, um, it's important, it's like any other relationship, it's important to get a response, you know, when we're having uh, an engagement with the horses, we need to be able to see and check in with them as far as how this is working for them. Because just like people, horses learn at different rates. Uh, they have different levels of emotional and mental maturity. And sometimes, you know, and uh, of course with physical maturity as well. So all of these play into uh, the level of comfort that horses have and or discomfort and being able to communicate that is not necessarily very easy for them. Mm -hmm. You said horses are stoic. Yes. And we almost, uh, not, to, not to paraphrase you completely here, but we almost tend to neglect them and we tend to think that they're, they're going to be fine. Um, where, where do you think this comes from? First? Is it because they're large animals? A dog is smaller, something like that? Like um, I think it's the job that we see horses having as far as like, you know, dogs are more companion animals and most people see horses as still more of a work animal, even though we don't use them to get from point A to point B any longer. Uh, they still wind up having a job as far as, you know, um, performing a certain um, set of, you know, in a sport, such like, um, you know, and that becomes their job. So, you know, and when humans are asking and training horses to do these specific jobs, you know, we expect some resistance or, you know, misunderstandings and things like that. And sometimes people will just assume that a horse is responding in a way that is because they're just being unwilling, but not necessarily because they are confused or don't understand something. So when it comes to making sure that we are clear in our communication, um, we also have to make sure that we have a higher level of awareness of how that lands with the horse too. Mm -hmm. So, because because they work, uh, they use for work quite frequently. We mm -hmm. just assume that any resistance to doing what they're supposed to do is just born out of stubbornness or something. Right. Right. Oh wow, it's a huge mis misconception, I mm -hmm. guess. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that the work you do right now for horses uh, was inspired by what happened to a rescue horse you had a while back called mm -hmm. Beauty. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, at the time, I was working with a significant other and we were trimming horses. And I was just driving along the road and looked over and saw this horse running with a really big head bob. So, you know, in, in the world of horses, we recognize a big head bob as far as that being an indication of the limping. And so we left a card for the horse owner, for the owner, and uh, he wound up calling us and we came across what the underlying problem of the the horse's soreness was. 
And it was that she'd gotten kicked in the shoulder as a young horse by another really large horse. And uh, it wound up dislocating her shoulder actually to where she couldn't, she didn't have full range of motion with that, that leg to the point where um, when she went to go land on her foot, it would actually roll back and she'd roll forward and land on the bottom of her leg, like the cannon bone. And it was just it was utterly heartbreaking seeing her in that condition. And the, the person who owned her didn't have a vet look at her when the injury happened initially, and he was just going to kind of leave her like that. So we basically wound up buying her and um, doing an experiment to see if we could make an improvement on her leg. And we used a shoe, welded a bar to the front of it, and then wrapped her leg in padding in order to um, protect it and offer a bracing. And so we could get the ligaments to strengthen back up. And after about six weeks of that, uh, she was actually able to start standing on that leg and locking it out and letting the other leg that had been supporting her since that injury uh, have some relief. And she just kind of let it swing and just get some relief from that. And then from there, she just kept improving to the point where she didn't need the brace any longer. And uh, she was able to run and play and buck in the pasture and uh, play with the other horses. And so she had a good quality of life, um, but she would never be 100 percent sound just because there was damage to her structurally. Um, and then I, at that point, I just I really realized how important the saying no hoof, no horse really is, is because, you know, the horse's comfort really does like humans to a degree starts with our com the comfort of their feet and it affects everything. Mm. So mm. Well, you said you were working with your partner then. Were you uh, what, what, what were you guys doing? Uh, um, so what, basically what we were doing is we were just, we were professional trimmers, uh, hoof trimmers, so farriers. And, oh, uh, okay. yep. And so we were just going out there and, um, working and, and treating horses that, uh, went, were just strictly barefoot horses. I see. And, uh, yeah, I mean, so even though you were just trimming the hoofs of horses, you, you were able to buy this horse and then, well, nurse, nurse, nurse the horse back to some type of, I don't know, functionality mm -hmm, in, in mm -hmm. some sense. So Quality of life. Uh, yeah. Do farriers do, uh, do beyond just trimming hooves? Or do they do yeah, so, much more than that? So there's a part where um, there's a corrective trimming part of, of working with horses' feet. Um, because horses will suffer from things like contracted heels and um, laminitis. And these are diseases that affect the, the horse's ability to be comfortable and um, have full range of motion. Okay. And so by being a farrier, we actually did a lot of corrective trimming. Um, there's, you know, we, we worked on horses that had everything from clubbed feet to um, extreme overgrowth, you know, where you see the the horses or donkeys have long toes and it looks like their feet are slippers and not feet any longer. Mm -hmm. um, we worked with a, a wide variety of animals like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. So so you do corrective trimming, not just uh, maintenance-based trimming Correct. that you would see. Okay. Yep. How long how long have you been like how long have you been a farrier, would you say? Um I started back in my twenties, so um I'm forty eight now, so about almost thirty years. Thirty years. That's that's uh, that's experience you can buy right there. For sure. Yeah. 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 So you definitely I would say you definitely know this more than anyone else <laughs> in terms of um really understanding uh what an animal well like a horse will go through um just as part of the everyday process of doing the job, mm -hmm. you know, either as a workhorse or as a as a horse for sport, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. that's three decades of experience right there. That's good. I think this is a good opportunity to get into the question of uh, your relationship with horses, right? Mm -hmm. And and what they actually mean to you. Mm -hmm. You want? Um, oh, that is that's a that's a big question. That's a loaded question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean. <laughs> So for me, um, horses, oh God. So, you know, I, I don't normally talk about this, but for me, my horses are my sanctuary. Mm. Um, they, uh, there's just something about being around horses that makes me feel like I'm in my element, um, kind of like a fish in water. Um, I'm just at my most natural state when I'm with my horses and, um, the relationship that I have with them, it uh, it's it's really fine tuned to the ones that I do have. To where you know I recognize that they have per their personalities, and in their own way, they they all talk to me and have a conversation. And um, 
it, it and it's such a subtle manner um, that uh, that they do it. So for like example, I have one horse that was given to me uh, because he was kind of a retired dressage and jumping horse and had lameness in his back end, um, and they just quite couldn't quite figure it out. So he basically was retired to being Uncle Amigo, and uh, and he. Um, when I first got him, he was kind of fried from being a performance horse and um, and just, you know, didn't, wasn't not, not in a good space. He was, you know, angry. He was upset. He was untrusting. Um, he had been hurt and uh, he was just, he was kind of done with people. So I really worked on building up the trust with him again and uh, to the point where now I just put a halter on him and just let him free roam. And uh, he's like a big dog. And when he's done eating grass, he'll come over and uh, hangs out where the, the treats are. And uh, he doesn't help himself, even though like the door is wide open, the bag of treats is wide open. He doesn't help himself. He's very much a gentleman about it. But he just comes over there and stands and that's his quietly asking mm. for treats. <laughs> and he's just he's got a, a really cool personality that way. Um, and then when it comes to riding horses, um, it's it's I'm able to just feel kind of not just the body, but like where they are emotionally. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, you saw that movie, uh, Chris, or, um, uh, the Cameron, James Cameron, James movie. Cameron? Okay. Yep. where the avatar, where they had these, these tails and they would yeah. like connect them into the animals and then it would be like a mind meld. Uh -huh. Um, it's kind of like that when I get on horses and work with them is just like, I just, if I do something on a horse and they re react in a negative way, um, I can kind of like, uh, just kind of go into my own mind as far as how I would perceive what caused that and um, and be able to understand from the horse's point of view why the, why that's a negative response and then work with them to show them that, you know, whatever caused that negative response, it doesn't have to be that triggering again and work them through it to where they're okay with that, whatever that ask was that initially triggered them. Um, and it's just, it's really, it's really interesting, you know. Um, I... Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, for me, it's it's borderline magical. You know, yeah. I just I love it. And for me, I just that's I'm in my happy place when I'm with my horses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, we're shooting this podcast in the middle of the city. Does it feel weird to be here versus to be just back, <laughs> you know, in the stable with the horses and everything? No, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty well accustomed to, you know, okay. you know, doing business in the city and everything. My my favorite place to be is definitely out with the horses. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll even, you know, sometimes I just randomly go out in the pasture and just hang out with them. And uh, that usually doesn't last very long with me just hanging there and standing there because then they come over and they're like, hey, you know, my itchy spot. Can you get that now? Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so it they turns, do that? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. It, and it's funny, too, because it turns into like this whole grooming chain because uh -huh. I have three horses and I have two hands. So I'm like, well, I can scratch two of you guys at one time, but I can't scratch three of you. So one horse will be itching on another horse and I'll be scratching them. And, you know, it just it's like this chain of like group, mutual grooming. And uh, it, it's just funny how it just evolves into that. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I often wonder, there are some people who live in a city, maybe in the middle of all the hustle and bustle. Mm -hmm. And they always think about, oh, I'm going to go back into the woods. I'm going to go back into nature mm -hmm. and um and just be one with it. Uh, how appealing would be would it be to to um, to just get out of a city lifestyle and just get into into you know um, riding horses, taking care of horses, and just living with them every day versus versus this? How would it, like if you had to talk to someone who who was thinking about doing something like that? Mm -hmm. what, what I would, would highly encourage it. Um, huh. And then I would also encourage people to you know kind of do some research and study because you know they're. A lot of people that get into horses, you know, have, um, you know, have some experience either, you know, they grew up riding horses or they have family members that have horses. But then there's some people that get into horses and they don't know the first thing about them. And all they see is, you know, like TikTok videos of, you know, people, you know, playing with the horses and feeding them carrots and they make funny faces and that's all they know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that can actually lead to a really dangerous situation, not just for the person but for the horses too because you know what a person thinks uh is okay to you know cute or funny to you know give the horses actually you know a, a danger to their health you know like I, I know one person that um you know the horse was had to take medicine or something like that and she was feeding the horse like orange slices and fruit loops and the horse's bodies are just not 
designed process, you know, processed sugar like that. And it actually can make them really, really sick. Mm -hmm. So, you know, education is everything. And, you know, going into it, it's like going into anything else, you know, like if you were looking at going into golf or something like that, you'd mm -hmm. want to know that, you know, there's certain ways to hold the club and then there's certain shoes that, you know, help, you know, give you the traction to get that swing and stuff like that. And horses are no different. If anything, they're far more um, critical as far as knowing some of the nuances of, of horse ownership, just because it's a living, breathing animal that, you know, can be dangerous at times, you know, if they're scared or, or, um, you know, have a bad reaction, um, or, you know, and their systems are very delicate too. So if they're fed the wrong things that can make them really sick. Okay. So basically don't go into it because you think you think it'll be fun because you've seen some videos online, mm -hmm. go into it because you actually law of horses and you right well i mean you can go into it for fun for sure i mean i have tons of fun with my horses all the time yeah you know and they have very fun personalities um just make sure that you know it's it's not um frivolous fun you mm. know it, it it has to be kind of if it will mutually beneficial um because actually horses have a sense of humor too <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm learning a lot today a sense of humor yes wow okay uh, how, how do you detect that? Um, well, then you give me an example of uh, sure. do you say something, you say joke, and they like no, so like it's, it's raise their legs or something. So it's how horses engage with their environment. Um, so, like I, I remember reading books about racehorses uh, that will drink, uh, you know, take a drink of water, and for people that wanted to get a photo op, they would stand by the horse's door, and the horse would come over with that mouthful of water and spit it on the people. Oh. <laughs> and they just think that's and they just stand back and watch the reactions of the people and they think that's the funniest thing in the world wow. <laughs> wow. and i actually did experience that in person one time so hmm. that's a good way to want to interact with horses versus just thinking you can fit them like random things like you said mm -hmm. and and you know like actually if you can interact with with a horse and and do it playfully and you know the horse does what you just described and you're actually having fun mm -hmm. good fun with the horse versus yep. frivolous fun right yep okay got it um okay let's move away from the subject of fun <laughs> and talk about uh you know taking the, the way healthcare is nowadays around uh, for horses and for animals uh, related similar to horses right so what does uh horse healthcare look like in the present day uh and how, 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 how does that compare to, to the past? Um, so we've got a lot of advances in uh, medicine that we've done with horses, you know, similar to the, the human world. Um, and a lot of therapies that we use for humans will actually cross over and work for horses as well. I mean, there's mm -hmm. horse chiropractors, acupuncturists, massage therapists, um, red light therapy, uh, um, electronic magnet pulse therapy. There's, there's a lot of therapies out there for horses. Um, and, uh, you know, which is nice because, you know, I think the, it, it leads to their longevity for sure. Um, I think the world's oldest horse in the Guinness Book of World Records is 50, 50 years old and he was an Irish uh, draft. So, mm. 50 years old. Mm -hmm. Wait, so I'm thinking right now as you as you you're talking about the healthcare system being so broad and you having different you know you have acupuncturist chiropractors and other people right let's go back to your the horse you talked about earlier on beauty mm -hmm. right the owner just neglected the horse basically yeah uh, yeah is it okay shouldn't horses be considered like uh especially if you own them like your children i don't know like your something you're responsible for for or, sure you know animals you're responsible for and if they're sick and obviously sick, in, mm -hmm. you know, like in, that, in the case of beauty, they should be treated. Otherwise, the owner needs to be, the horse needs to be taken away or some kind of, something needs to be done. Is, is, that, is that the case? Or, yeah, or mean, you can just let a horse be suffering and nothing gets done to you. No, there's actually, um, uh, there's actually an organization called Hooved Animals uh, Humane Society. Um, and I think they're based out of uh, Woodstock, Illinois, actually. Um, but the challenge with that is, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to find horses that are, you know, suffering or neglected like that sometimes mm. just because, you know, if a person has a lot of land, uh, the horses can be out there and, you know, it's the person sees them, but not other. It's it's not open to the public being able to pass by and see them very easily. Yeah. So so it, it's um, easy to get overlooked when the horse is in a bad situation like that. Yeah. 
Wow, that's that's pretty sad. And there's no like regulatory body that will do like inspections. No, 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 no. So the the best that we have is, you know, local authorities, you know, if, if somebody sees a horse being underfed and they're, you know, real bony and they look like they could use some food and they're standing there with no food in front of them. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, you can have luck with calling the local sheriff department or something like that. And if, you know, the, it's, it varies by a different area. Um, sometimes they give them a warning. Sometimes, you know, it's extreme enough to where they'll step in and, and remove the animals from the, the property. Um, but again, it, it's, it's not something that's managed, um, on a national scale, if you will. Good to know. Uh, well. I, I just hope the system gets better. Uh, I mean, if, if you had a child and and the child didn't show up to school, then, mm -hmm. then you know, mm -hmm. the proper authorities will figure out what's happening and take the child away from you, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've talked about horses a little bit. We can get back into the subject of horses and horse health care in, in, uh, later on in the podcast. But right now, let's talk about your company. Let's okay. talk some business, all right? Okay. Uh, Intuitive horseware. Mm -hmm. What is it all about? Um, so basically what I'm looking to do is use technology to help give the horse a voice. Mm -hmm. um, and by doing that, the idea is to be able to um, see how the horse is moving on a regular basis and create a baseline normal for what is normal for how that horse moves and um, give the rider insight, if you will, to that operating system of, you know, when the horse is starting to suffer from some type of pain, whether it's from, you know, landing cr incorrectly uh, from a jump or if it's the tack is ill-fitting or something like that, um, rather than letting the horse just endure and, you know, and not being aware of there being a problem, uh, the idea is that the technology would alert the rider that something's going on and they need to check something out. Okay, so that's the overall premise of uh, intuitive horseware. Um, is there a particular type of pain you want to track, or do you want to just track every type of uh, condition the horse on the go um, is going through? Um, yeah, I mean, the thing with horses is that the source of pain can be in multiple places all at once. So some, you know, because it's all connected. So, you know, they could have something going on with the hoof that winds up leading to a problem in the shoulder that leads to being something that's le a problem in the uh, hips and then it shows up in the hock. So it could be like a multi-point um, areas where the horse is struggling to move or feel comfortable. Um, so really it's about uh, just making the riders aware um, as far as looking at the horse's conformation, their feet, and how the horse is moving without any tack, with tack, and then with the tack and rider to s help discern if there's any changes between those things. And then that will kind of help the riders shortcut what the core issue is. Okay. Fantastic. Using technology to help give the horse a voice. Mm -hmm. uh, I can imagine a lot of... Uh, I don't know, uh, entities, people soci in society who are just stoic, who don't have a voice to. And uh, it just makes sense to me because if you don't, if, if you're an animal or a human being, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm mixing both right now, mm -hmm. but any animal or human being who is very stoic will definitely need people to stand for them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're mm -hmm. just going to suffer in silence. Right. And that's, that's what I'm thinking about as I'm, as I'm hearing all of this. Um, and if you're not going to, you know, use your sense of humor as a host to communicate your pain, mm -hmm. uh, then you might as well just use some type of technology. Right. Okay. Right. We'll, we'll get into technology in, 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 in some detail soon, but, um, you talked about lameness, mm -hmm. you know, earlier on the podcast. Can you yeah. define what that is? So lameness, the kind of like the basic de definition is, um, so if you or I were to twist our ankle or stub our toe, we could still move around, but we're going to move with like a distinct limp or, you know, a change in our gait. Uh, ultimately, that's what lameness means for horses is, um, is that they just don't have that full range of motion or that they're moving with obvious pain. Okay. Okay, cool. Lameness. There are a lot of terms relating to horses that I, right. I would like you to define. Uh, I mean, I was going through, like, to do some research for this podcast. I was going through, uh, I was, <laughs> and some of these things I knew before, like a foal is mm -hmm. a is a is a newborn horse or it's a young horse. A yeah. Young horse. Usually yeah. anything under a year old. 
a year old. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's so many terms. So if we, mm-hmm. if you mention anything along the podcast that is that I think the audience isn't familiar with, we just define them as we go, right? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So let's talk about some hardware. Mm-hmm. Um, just a brief overview of uh, uh, of of the technology. We'll start from the hardware part of it, and then we'll get to the software part of the technology okay. soon. Okay. So. Your technology uses hardware sensors on the horses, mm-hmm. uh, such as accelerometers, gyroscopes, and magnetometers, mm-hmm. in collaboration with monitoring software. Mm-hmm. So can you explain how this all works together? So the idea is to be able to use the um, sensors, kind of like Fitbit for horses, if you will, where Fitbit. the... Yep, where the horse, where the sensors would be able to detect how the horse is moving, and then the um, software would be able to determine whether that's normal movement or abnormal movement. Hypothetically, mm-hmm. how many horses can become pain-free due to this technology every year? Like, how many horses with lameness, mm-hmm. with uh, uh, limp issues, with mm-hmm. other issues that, that that are not being detected right now? How mm-hmm. many could we alleviate over the period of a year, every year? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Um, well, there's been studies that show that over 70% of performance horses are experiencing some degree of pain that are going unnoticed. Wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so there are about 9 million horses in uh, in the U.S. currently. So that would be 70% of 9 million. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? That's uh, 6.3 million? Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's a big problem. It is. 70% of performance horses are going through some type of pain. And so when you say performance, you mean like uh, equestrian? Sports. Uh, so or? it could be anything English or Western riding. So English would be, you know, what you th- think of when you see a horse jumping uh, or the dressage horses and going through their fancy maneuvers. Um, or And then there's Western riding where, you know, you've got working cow horse where, you know, or cutters where the horse is keeping one, one cow away from a group of other cows. Um, or the reining performance where they do a, a set, a series of um, designated patterns and they just kind of have a lot of a flash and, and, you know, enthusiasm about that. Hmm. Wow. 6.3 million mm-hmm. horses are in pain every year. That's... That's crazy. And, um, okay, let's, let's, uh, we'll talk about this in detail. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, in, we'll t- in a discussion about equestrian sports and things like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, just very quickly, outside of horses, are there any, uh, any other animals this could be used for, let's say, in the future? I know you're not thinking that far probably mm-hmm. right now, but. Um, yeah, actually, the dairy industry or the, the cattle industry, um, especially in the dairy industry, they actually deal with a lot of uh, cows being lame because of abscesses um, and infection and things like that. And uh, I, I, I know that they've tried using AI to kind of help um, discern that. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, the cattle industry and then actually... Um, I, as in my research of doing, you know, knowing how to tackle this problem, um, I came across studies done on camels, racing mm-hmm. camels, actually. And that was definitely not on my radar, but apparently where, where you know, people live where there's a lot of camels, they camels, like to race them. Yeah. And, so uh, the Middle East, probably? Yes, yes. Oh. Yep. Yeah, that's actually going to be huge mm-hmm. because this is uh, a reality transportation for transportation and for. Well, mainly transportation mm-hmm. in those areas, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So really, any large animal that people don't tend to think about, in, in they don't tend to consider pets. Right. I yep. would think, yep. right? No? What's the, They typically call them livestock. Livestock. Okay. Yep. Livestock. Okay. So that's that's a way to look at it. Okay. So it, yeah, the, the reach of this is not 6.3 million anymore. It's, it's, you're looking at what? The tens of millions now? Mm-hmm. Based on globally, you know, yeah, yeah, globally, based on the other animals, the, the cows, the camels, and all that. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's that's pretty cool. Now let's go back to horses, right? How do you see your device or your technology overall um, being used in horse equestrian events up to the Kentucky Derby mm-hmm. or the Olympics? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so. When it comes to that, it would be you know it would be something that would be able to take some of the human bias out of, you know, judging these these events and be able to bring in a little bit more um, uh, leveling the playing field and, you know, ensure like a higher degree of integrity as well. Uh-huh. 
So, so take out human bias, increase in, uh, integrity in the sport, integrity in the sport. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've seen, I'm not an expert in this space, mm -hmm. I, but the little I know is, yeah, at least I know that there's a lot of, a lot of things that happen to these animals. Mm -hmm. And some of them are being fed a certain way. Some of them are being injected with things. And, mm -hmm. and there's probably some improper things going on. Right. Right. So anything this would cause a lot of problems like if if just if, if you were tracking the the the, uh, the 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 animals it might cause a lot of problems and, and 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 reveal a bunch of secrets no yeah and honestly you know ideally that would be one of the big positives that come out of it because you know it ties back into you know adding more integrity and you know at the end of the day eliminating the suffering of the horses because when they're being injected with a lot of stuff it's to mask that they're in pain when they're performing mm. basically they're just kind of souped up and meant to cross that line as fast as possible no matter what wow mm -hmm. all for money yeah i mean it, it not not Every horse out there, you know, racetrack horses like that or, you know, they're, they're managed that way. But there's a lot of them. And so being mm -hmm. able to, you know, help shine a light on some of the bad actors would be, with technology, would be ideal, honestly. Yeah, I see that. Um, let's, let's talk about uh, the flip side of it, which mm -hmm. is, okay, so we've talked about integrity. We've talked about taking out human bias. But can it? be considered an unfair advantage if say for example you mm -hmm. decide to go into the kentucky derby and mm -hmm. derby and you have you have your trackers on your on your horse and you can sense whatever is happening to your horse would it, would it provide you an unfair advantage or the soup top horses will probably do better anyway um yeah if anything the soup top horses would probably <laughs> wind up being to, because the idea is you know not to i mean basically we're just monitoring how the horse is moving mm -hmm. it's there's nothing um that is creating a, an advantage of uh, you know, to the rider, it's basically what we're bringing to the table is higher level of awareness of what's going on with the horse and how they're moving. I would, I would be very curious to see if the, you know, the International Olympic Committee, for example, the IOC, I don't know who regulates the Kentucky Derby, mm -hmm. Derby but let's talk about the Olympics. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be curious if, if they would implement something like this to just um, say, okay, if you're going to compete in the Olympics, yeah, okay, we got to put all this stuff on your horse, then we got to detect what's happening, make sure the horse isn't, it's pain free. And just ready to compete like the way, uh, and well, some athletes actually are souped up too. So <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying right now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say uh, the horses should compete just like humans, you know, compete. You know, the yeah, hundred meter dash or something like that. <laughs> but you're souped up too. Mm -hmm. So, so what am I even talking about? Uh, but uh, but it would be nice if they if they try to uh, you know make this events more humane to mm -hmm. the animals. You know, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, the thing is, is that horses ultimately love doing their job. They love mm -hmm. having, you know, engagement with people. Um, what they don't love doing is being asked to perform when they're in pain. Mm -hmm. So when they start having resistance to being asked to perform, people will assume it's because the horse is, you know, being unwilling. But the truth of the matter is that the horse is usually suffering some, some kind of discomfort. So if we can you just kind of help clarify that, um, because ultimately... Most people love their horses and yeah. they don't want to do anything that causes them harm. And, you know, they're not actively out there trying to do anything that would jeopardize the health of the horse. Um, so but it, it just comes down to just a lack of awareness of what to look for that, you know, indicates that the horse is happy, healthy, correct and balanced uh, versus one that's, you know, struggling. Um, OK, so let's go beyond the competitive landscape and uh, talk about how the technology would benefit uh, horses themselves and riders just, you know, on a ranch, uh, uh, just everyday living. Mm -hmm. How would, I know you've talked about it a little bit, but let's just talk about it in more detail. Okay. How do you see this improving the life of horses um, and, and the riders overall? Um, the, the way it would improve the horse's life is that, um, whenever they start to struggle with dealing with any kind of pain, um, the riders would become aware of it sooner and be able to address the issues sooner. Um, and that's that's really the the whole idea and the name of the game of just being able, because it's like, like anything else, you know, um, the longer a, a 
problem exists, the harder it is to correct. Um, mainly because especially it becomes this domino effect where it's like, it's not just one area of the body that's affected, it's multiple locations in the body that the horse is struggling with. Mm -hmm. So by being able to bring awareness to the riders that something's going on and the horse needs to have, um, you know, either a change of tack or chiropractic work or acupuncture work or something that will be able to address the issue, one, it gets the the problem addressed at the core, but then it also helps the rider understand that whatever they were doing before that kind of led up to that, to now stop doing that and do something differently. Mm -hmm. That's that's pretty good. That's mm -hmm. good. It's very good. Let's get into the topic of AI. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like you can't go any podcast. You can't, I, I can't really do a podcast nowadays without mentioning AI mm -hmm. because it's, it's changing everything. Um, so let's start off with this. You combine machine learning and AI to analyze the movement and overall health of the, of the horse, right? Mm -hmm. yep. uh, you want to talk about that in a bit of detail, about how that works? Sure. Um, so the nice thing about being able to train um, AI to recognize what are normal movement patterns with horses is again, you're getting this unbiased information um, that is fact-based. And then also um, when it comes to recognizing um, abnormal m movement patterns uh, with the horse, then it kind of takes some of the guesswork out of it as far mm. as, you know, you know, because like sometimes you can put a horse that's, you know, suffering some kind of a lameness in front of five different people and you'll get five different answers as what they think the cause is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it kind of takes some of the guesswork out and, you know, any, any type of human bias that, you know, it, a farrier might be leaning towards the feet, but you know the vet might be leaning towards something in, in the, the skeletal structure. And you know, at the end of the day, they might both be right. Um, but being able to just have a much better, a clearer picture of what the ultimate problem is, and ideally being able to help them get to the the core root of the problem, and not just treat the symptoms. Yeah, yeah. And I'm always fascinated about uh, when I talk about AI. I always talk about AGI mm -hmm. and with some of the advances that are going on right now and with text to video and everything, I always say that the last frontier of AI will be when AI starts to dream, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when it starts to, to become creative, when it can do things without data, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or, well, without direct data, right? Right. right. So having said that, for horses, mm -hmm. uh, do you think we're going to get to a future where it can AI can predict situations in which the horse will put itself that will cause it pain? Yes, and help you avoid that. Yep. Ultimately, yeah, I do. I believe that with the pattern recognition, that the B, the AI will be able to not only detect abnormal pattern movements, but also predict um, what's the like most likely area of concern that's causing the horse to move that way. Which you know ultimately is fantastic because it's going to help the um, veterinarians treat it better. It's going to help the farriers correct whatever issue is going on. Um, and it's just going to shorten that time, that amount of time that the horse is, you know, having to endure any type of pain. Wow. Yes. <laughs> you, you already like, yeah, bring it on. Uh, yeah, bring it, bring on that last frontier of AI right now for these horses. I love them so much. I want to make sure they're taken care of. 100%. Yeah. 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 I would say that. I mean, AI is not your enemy. Find a way to use it to your advantage. Right. And if, exactly. if it helps, if it helps keep mm -hmm. horses safe, pain free, I mean, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Having said that, do you think AI will revolutionize our relationship with the animal kingdom or do you think it will hurt it? Do you think, you know, using AI to, outside of just pain management or pain, uh, taking care of pain mm -hmm. in animals, just overall, mm -hmm. do you think that uh, bringing AI into the, the space like yours mm -hmm. would help us interact better with animals? Absolutely. Um, because again, like the biggest challenge that humans have in interacting with horses is that, you know, we lay around our own biases. We lay around our own perspectives. Um, we make assumptions that have sometimes nothing to do with the horses. You know, we, we think that horses are like, you know, limping when they come out of the stall just so they can, you know, get out of, um, or, you know, they come out of a stall and they're sound and then you put saddle on and now they're limping and we just think that the horse is faking. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, that would probably be an indication of poor tack fit. Um, but 
a lot of people make these inaccurate assessments, you know, assumptions. So by being able to bring AI into it and um, help bring more awareness as far as what to look for, you know, when a horse's eye looks a certain way or when their facial expression is a certain way um, or, when, you know, when their body position is a certain way that this is an indicating <clears throat> that they're either comfortable or in discomfort, then it's just going to help riders, especially the ones that genuinely like really care and want to, you know, do the very best for their horses. Um, it's just going to help them do a better job of being able to do that with confidence and give them peace of mind that, you know, they're, they're on the right track to make sure. Because, you know, at the end of the day, the horse can't tell us when they're in pain, but they also can't really tell us when they're feeling that great either. Mm -hmm. You know, other than, you know, we see a happy horse and they're running around in the pasture bucking and playing. We're like, well, that looks like a happy horse. Um, but, uh, you know, it also would give us confirmation that, you know, what we're doing with the horse is working for them too. Mm. It's pretty nice to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to take it a step further. Mm -hmm. and this is going to sound weird. There's an article that was published in the Scientific American a few months ago that describes how artificial intelligence could finally let us talk with animals. Mm -hmm. Actually talk, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Is oh, this feasible think, or, or fantasy? Yeah, no, I think that that's definitely feasible. And what? I mean, oh, totally. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that at all. You know, okay. I, so, yeah, so I, I love technology and I love geeking out on it. And, you know, I could see this going in a direction where, you know, we could actually um, monitor the brain waves of what's going on with horses and be able to, you know, um, you know, have an even more informed conversation with them. Okay. <laughs> wow. Not that we're going to get Mr. Ed, you know, moving his lips and talking to us with yeah. a human voice, but, you know, we will definitely be able to um, take a lot of the, the mystery that's still in there in, in working mm. the horses out. Mm. Okay. Wow. So uh, let's have a, a discussion uh, beyond technology. Let's talk about uh, horse riding for, for fun or for sport. Mm hmm how expensive how costly is it to, for how costly is horse riding nowadays um it can be anywhere from you know spending a couple hundred dollars a month to you know with just being a recreational trail rider to many multiple thousands of dollars a month you know if you're training paying a trainer and you know um competing at a high level of in performance of a sport is this something that well i know you already said just a hundred dollars a month but how much value can you get out of that for um if you really wanted to be a competitive horse rider for example mm -hmm. i mean how much value can you get out of hundred dollars a month will it be much more expensive than that oh yeah it, it's really i mean it's hard to come i mean sometimes just the shoes alone cost that much so <laughs> yeah so it, so there's so it should be a lot more than 100 then mm -hmm. well i mean so if you have a recreational rider who is barefoot and they just ride in their pasture or they ride in the you know an area that's close to them that you know is just local or they haul to you know the closest forest reserve mm -hmm. um it, it's really not going to cost very much a month for the the horse owner especially if they keep the horses on their own property yeah. it's not going to cost them that much you know and that and that is just really for the recreation and the, just the joy of being with horses and enjoying nature um so that's kind of like the the like the most entry level of um expense to horse maintenance so, and enjoying so just get yourself some land off mm -hmm. off grid you know, put some horses on mm -hmm. it it's not that expensive well in texas no, <laughs> the land's gotten quite expensive yeah. actually most places um but as far as managing horses you know if you already have your own property um and your own facilities then cost you know the cost of Taking care of horses goes way, way down. Okay. Okay. It's good to know. Mm -hmm. Just for anyone who is curious about, mm -hmm. you know, getting into it and, you know, going yep. and getting into uh, horse riding or just taking care of horses or living with horses, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, on a lighter note, there's a popular trend on social media. Uh, and it's a fascination with farriers mm -hmm. trimming horse, horses' hooves. Uh well, what do you think about that? Do you think it's a positive thing? or Because it's, it's videos tend to be therapeutic sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I think it's a very good thing um, because it's it's I see it as more as just an educational tool so, so that the more people get used to seeing something like that and, you know, can recognize a job well done, then they you know can also recognize when when, you know, something's not correct. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, 
any dangers to it? You know, you talked about frivolous fun earlier mm -hmm. on. Any dangers to that? Do you think you'd invite any of that type of stuff? Well, if somebody who doesn't know the first thing about trimming horses and they pick up a, you know, a set of n nippers, well, hoof trimmers, um, and they think that they're going to just start nipping away at their horse's feet and maintain it on their own, that can be quite dangerous because they can make their horse very sore and lame them very, very badly, very quickly with yeah. not having any education. So, yeah. Oh wait, it, it, you know what? I'm curious. This might be a good time to just define some horse terms. You mm -hmm. want to? You want absolutely. <laughs> you want to give us some terms sure. and define them. Um. So maybe we, explain what I just said. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You said. Uh, well, you. What did you? You you nippers. Nippers. Yes. What's that? So think of them as really big nail clippers for for horses. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of obvious, <laughs> nippers. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so they look like a pair of pliers uh, with sharpened edges, and you know, a horse a farrier will go around the horse's foot and just cut off the excess uh, fo um, excess growth on the horse's foot. Yeah. Gait. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that? What is that in terms of in terms of horses? A, a gait, as in like the, G A I T. Yeah, uh, as in the way that the horse moves. So the the gait is referred to um, as far as just the movement of the horse, and then they have different types of speed. So there's the walk, there's the trot, um, then there's a slow lope or run, uh, and then a full gallop. Hmm. Okay. We've already defined a uh, what a foal is. What would you call a male horse? Stallions. Stallions. Well, so there's stallions that are fully intact, and then you have geldings that once were stallions, but they've been neutered kind of like a male dog. Mm. What do you call a female horse? Mares. Mares. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Uh, this, is, this is all very interesting. I wish <laughs> I... Uh, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, okay. I think that that covers it. Mm -hmm. So we got uh, foals, we got stallions, we got mares. We've defined limbness. We defined some of that terms. That, sh that should pretty much cover it if you're trying to get into uh, if you're trying to get into uh, horse riding and taking care of horses, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back to uh, intuitive horseware. Mm -hmm. I know um, things uh, are, are you know are in the infant stage right now mm -hmm. a little bit. What, what's likely to be achieved uh, within the next one to two years? Um, so right now we're developing the product and uh, should have my MVP within the next three to six months. Um, and then for from there, uh, then it's just a matter of just doing the launch and getting the product into people's hands. Um, so ideally, uh, in the first year that we'll have uh, about 10,000 users to start with. Mm -hmm. um, in the second year, uh, I could see it growing quickly into 50,000 users. And then just kind of growing rapidly from there. I mean, there are a lot of ranches in Texas. There Do you intend to start start right here? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's actually one of the reasons why I moved to Texas. Oh, okay. From where? Uh, from Minnesota. Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Way I have a lot of questions. Way I, I I can understand horses surviving the weather here all year round, but Minnesota? Mm -hmm. yep. uh, tell me a little bit about minus forty degrees degree weather and horses. Horses that have um, a, a healthy coat and uh, are plenty fat, they absolutely love that cold weather. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen, you? oh my gosh, I've seen horses where it's like 25 below zero and they have, you know, crystals on their eyelashes and, and you know, ice particles on their, their whiskers of their nose. And they're out running and playing and rolling in the snow and they just having a blast. Wow. <laughs> Someone should make videos of those horses. Like, that would be fun to watch. Mm -hmm, for sure. Ah. Uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and now back to the uh, the future of um, um, of intuitive houseware. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I was talking about ranches, and you were saying that it's pretty easy to just have someone with a big piece of land and things happening to horses, and no one knows. Mm -hmm. Do you think the people who, well, I would say. The answer to this question will pr I probably can answer this question to a large extent. Let's just say, let's just phrase it this way: There's a percentage of ho owners of horses for whatever purpose that care about the horses, mm -hmm. right? And will probably latch onto this technology. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to be easy to convince those. Do you care about convincing those who don't care about it? About um, oh, I'm just going to soup up this horse to do what I whatever I need. Yeah, I mean, obviously, because my interest is in providing a service that ultimately uh, enhances the well-being of a horse's of the horse's welfare 
Um, so yeah, so I'm definitely, you know, my goal is to try and persuade or, you know, convert people to thinking of a, a more holistic approach to working with horses. And, you know, it's at, because at the end of the day, you know, when it comes to working with horses, like I said, they do enjoy their job. Um, and, you know, we can still perform with the horses. We can still do all the things that we want to do and race the horses, you know, because a lot of them, when they, they're running, they genuinely love to run. They just, you know, they wound up getting overtrained to the point where they can't really do their job. So the idea is to be able to help help people understand where that limit is because it's like you know you can't run a car where the you know the the um the gauge is running into the red the mm -hmm. red zone as you know you're overworking the engine you can't do that day in day out nonstop without the engine blowing and mm -hmm. you know the same applies to horses like you can't run them top speed day in day out constantly working them and the only time they get turnout is, you know, or any time they get out of a stall and, or keep them in a stall 23 hours a day, bring them out to run them top speed and then put them back. And it'd be like you or I, you know, hanging out on the couch 23 hours of the day. Mm. We go out and we run a 5K and we just try and run a four minute mile every time we do it. And and then we go back and we just hang out on the couch. We're just we're going to be a wreck. Mm. And, and same with horses, you know, and people just don't really think in that context. That's true. I see. Um Wow, I've learned a lot today. I, I I wanted to get into some of that topics about some of that um, discussions about about people who actually own own horses for different purposes and and what their psyche uh, is like. Mm -hmm. um, what would the what? Okay, let's 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 phrase it this way. What would a typical day be like for a horse owner? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say for farming. Mm -hmm. A typical day. Mm -hmm. What was what, what's that like? Um, you know, usually getting up early in the morning, taking care of the animals. Um, depends on you know what type of farm it is. You know, if it's if it's for raising and training horses, then you know getting all the horses fed and uh, you know start getting them into their exercise program as far as, you know, some of them get turnout, others, you know, a lot of them stay in their stalls and they only come out when they're getting prepared to work or exercise or train. Um, and then basically that is your daily routine until, you know, evening. And then it's a matter of just winding down, usually giving a second feeding to the horses and uh, go to bed and wake up and do it all over again. <laughs> hey, is, is it the same thing for someone who is who, who owns a, a race horse? Um, no, I mean, when it comes to somebody who owns a racehorse, typically they, they rarely, if ever touch the horse. What? They hire people to do that. So would you say they really do care about a horses then? Um, some, some genuinely I do believe. Yes. Um, there's a lot of them where, you know, the, the focus has been put more on syndicates and mm -hmm. just, you know, it's more of fulfillment of an ego or just kind of a status symbol. Mm -hmm. And they honestly don't know the first thing about horses. Um, and it's just something for them to brag about to other people. Okay. Wow. That's, that might be your audience right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, you just got to find a way to convince, to, to sell it to them, to convince them that it makes sense or to force them mm -hmm. to do it. It might be a regulatory thing, no? Uh, well, for them, it would be more like how do they get? It would be have to be more of a clinical ROI kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, and just like you know, being able to maintain the health of the horse better would cost them less money. Yeah. So then they can get a higher return on their investment. Uh, I, you know, I'm I'm cynical. I <laughs> I would just go to insurance companies and go to find a way to get some kind of law passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, insurance mm -hmm. companies are like, hey, you got to put those sensors on the horse and you got to detect what's going on with it. Otherwise, we're mm -hmm. not covering your horse. Right. Or, you know, regulatory bodies are like, hey, you can't bring it to the derby unless... Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's sometimes you know you know the, it, you can if the carrot if the carrot approach doesn't work sometimes you have to use the stick approach. You know? Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I, I'm gonna end. I'm gonna uh, close out the podcast on a final discussion on technology mm -hmm. within. Let's talk about horses specifically. Mm -hmm. So you are monitoring um, uh, horse health, you know, and things like that, and using uh, software, artificial intelligence, and all that to monitor what happens to the horses in real time and predict things. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's that's a technology for intuitive horseware. Are there any other things relating to horses where 
technology will be very helpful outside of health. You you think maybe performance instead of souping up a horse, mm-hmm. maybe there's a way to, I don't know, you, you know, for like runners, for example, mm-hmm. you can wear a certain type of shoe and it just makes you slightly faster. Right. It can help you beat that two hour, two hour, uh, is it two hour mile limit or something? You know, like mm-hmm. help you, you know, beat a record instead of two hours, now it's one hour, 59 minutes and 59 seconds, mm-hmm. right? Something like that. Mm-hmm. Is, is that, are there any other things relating to horses where technology could be very helpful? Um. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to, you know, being able to make sure that the equipment that we're using with them is, you know, the correct fit and, you know, is is appropriate yeah. for doing what we need, you know, appropriate for the comfort of the horse and being able to get, you know, perform whatever we're looking the horse to do. Mm-hmm. So, so there are a lot of performance, uh, there are a lot of things relating to performance that technology could could be helpful for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just and who knows? Maybe we can learn, you know, have a conversation with them at some point in time. Yeah, yeah, if you, style. yeah, yeah. Once you start having the, com- <laughs> I'm still trying to imagine it. But once you start having conversations with horses, you probably you probably will know things like, hey, I, I'm going to say something ridiculous. Hey, I need I need that thing dot dashed. Hey, can you can you build an app for that? <laughs> you know, can you, can you uh can you build something that can get me faster from here from from Bastrop to to downtown Austin, mm-hmm. you know, uh, mm-hmm. can you can you uh, uh, build a different type of material to cover me in the in, in the winter, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I, I know you think this works for me, and I and I joke around with it and I play around with it, but this might be a better match. I'm just thinking, mm-hmm. if animals could communicate, technology will be developed better for them. Yeah, we'd be getting text alerts. I want a treat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every yeah. Five text minutes. alerts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I'm fascinated to see how how that would turn out. I'm I'm also very fascinated with um, technology for unusual um, uh, spaces applications. applications mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So so um, I I think what you're doing is very awesome. Mm-hmm. And I think you know based on your decades decades of experience, you're obviously the best person to do it. And I'm I'm rooting for the success of this technology. I'm hoping that insurance companies you know tell riders that they have to mm-hmm. make sure the horses are healthy mm-hmm. or some i don't know regulatory body forces people to just take care of their horses better mm-hmm. yeah so you know and we can you know work towards all three goals at the same time kind of yeah thing, you know yeah now i'm just based on the way you describe the, the riders mm-hmm. i i'm cynical about i'm just like you got to force them you well, know? in certain industries, but again, like I said, most people who actually own the horses and have them, you know, they love them dearly and it, it's a passion project. You, yeah. know? you know, we, we don't need to spend thousands of dollars a month, you know, to compete and show with our horses um, yeah. just because we don't like animals. You know, it's like we could get a boat, we could do, yeah. you know, so many different other things. You know, it's like people at the end of the day genuinely do love and care for their horses. And okay. so it's just, you know, it's more about just helping them have a better understanding and have a higher level of awareness of what's what all's going on with the horse in a way that gives them confidence that they, you know, are doing the right thing or that they can help them. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's good to know. I was just talking about like people who ride for sport, like professional, right. yeah. or, like yeah. yeah, just talking about those people and and like you said, the the vast majority of other people who 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 who, who do things with horses are good people. They care about the animals, mm-hmm. so that's good. Yep. So, uh, finally, where can people find you if they have questions, if they want to support, you know, what you're doing? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn, uh, you know, Julia Parker and uh, Intuitive Horsewear. And then I'll also have a website, um, uh, Intuitive Horsewear. And horsewear is spelled uh, horse, H-O-R-S-E-W-A-R-E, as in like software, hardware mm-hmm. kind of spelling. Um, and uh, yeah, there's my website there. And uh, yeah, that would be the best, two best ways to be able to track me down and connect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This was a uh, interesting discussion. I'm mm-hmm. Very, ha- very happy you came and uh, very happy to have a discussion with you. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate this. And this is fun. I, I enjoy this. Thank you very much. And with that. Some great questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and with that, we've come to the end uh, of another episode of the Hard Tech Podcast. I'll see you guys on the next one. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and share this video. Also subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so that you see more content like this relating to robotics, transportation, 
healthcare, energy, and more.